everybody. My name is Crystal Vanderputten, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this panel discussion in what is the sixth and final Law Practice Management Series uh, program. Our program today is titled, This is Not Your Parents' Law Firm, and really it was just meant to capture the essence of the fact that law firm management has really changed over the years. And it's gone from what was a more traditional law firm style of management, which maybe is what you see in TV shows or movies, to something a little different these days. Um, as part of that discussion, we've got three panelists here who will introduce themselves in a moment and tell you about their firms and their practice um, and how they manage their firms. But I've got Renee Livingston of Livingston Law Firm, Marie Barnes, and Harry Stern. And they're all here to tell you a little bit about how they manage their law firm also discuss more specifically within that topic um, how that has changed or how the relationships differ between management and staff or other employees and attorneys at the law firm, the technology available today and how that impacts both negatively and maybe poses some problems as well uh, for law firm management and finally some of the financial uh, relationship aspects of different ways of managing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Renee first. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Renee Livingston, as Crystal said. And what we thought we'd do is just give you a little background of our respective um, you know, histories, where we came from, so you can kind of see what our positions or perspectives might be as we, as we have this dialogue. So um, I actually started Livingston Law Firm 15 years ago. Um, with the intent and purpose of being a women-owned business because I felt that there was going to be a lot of opportunity on the marketplace for that kind of a, um, a law firm. And it just kind of coincided with the entire diversity-based movement that was taking place in corporate America. And so that's how the firm started. Um, it, it has evolved over time. Right now we've got six lawyers. We're usually about seven. Um, and we're a general civil litigation firm. I joke with people because this firm is actually only my second real law job. Um, I started out of law school at a very typical insurance defense firm that when I joined was, was very typical. And so my first 14 years were spent um, in that kind of a firm structure that was the, you know, the pyramid structure where you had the partners that on top, we had no equity, or excuse me, non-equity um, partners in the firm, and we just had you know, offices and offices full of associate attorneys filling the heck out of files. And um, that's not a model that um, I have now, at this point in my career, adopted. In fact, we, we, are, we actually are the complete opposite of that, and there's reasons why we're doing that. But that's kind of my perspective and my background in what I bring today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marie Barnes. Um, I am a solo practitioner currently at the moment. I know on the uh, flyer it said I was associated with that. Marie, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. It's okay. the eight. Oh, it's the short. Sure. Yeah, the yeah. air. I was just saying that I'm a solo practitioner. Um, I was associated with Ad Astro Law Group. Uh, for the last year and a half, I recently had my second uh, son, so I've scaled back to accommodate family um, family time, I guess you would say. But when I came out of school, the economic climate was much different than when uh, Renee started her firm. Uh, and when I came out, there weren't that many first-year associate positions available. Um, when I finished law school, things did not look very positive for those coming out of school and becoming attorneys. So I started in a small firm here in the East Bay doing criminal defense, um, civil litigation, and personal injury. Since then, uh, I left there after about two years when I had my first son, looking for more flexibility. Um, it was a typical traditional firm, smaller firm, a little more flexible than some of the private practices, but still not exactly what I needed. So I just left and not really sure what I was gonna do. I started doing some contract work for some smaller firms, and that morphed into my association with Ad Astra Law Group, which is a startup firm in San Francisco. They've been in existence, I believe, going on three years. This will be the start of the third year. And 
uh, it's primarily civil litigation. Um, they do a few other small things uh, like trademarks, but it's mainly a business litigation employment law firm. Um, and as I mentioned, I had a, another child almost six months ago, and so now I'm I've kind of always had my own practice, uh, even though I did some independent work. And we'll get into that uh, as we go uh, more into this discussion. Into this discussion. Um, but my own practice is criminal defense and family. And I can, you know, go into more of how I how I started doing that. Um, but right now I'm trying to build my own practice. It's just me and kind of, you know, learning as I go and what it takes to manage a practice because there are two different things. There's the practice of law and there's the management of it. And you have to find a balance. I'm Harry Stern. Our firm is Reigns Lucia Stern. And uh, we have about 30 lawyers spread in five offices all over the state, so it's a little more of a traditional hierarchical makeup. Um, I've been the managing partner for about five years. I have absolutely no training in that. Um, I don't have uh, anything brilliant to um, impart to any of you about how to manage uh, a law firm. It's really a seat of the pants type thing. Every day is a new challenge. Um, most days, I just want to close my door and work on my own cases, but uh, somebody's got to, you know, make some of the decisions. And, you know, I do it, uh, and it can be rewarding at the end of the year when um, I think the greatest, maybe the only compliment I ever get is occasionally my partner's wives thank me at the end of the year. Uh, my formal training in business is none. Um, I think unless uh, they've changed things or you went to a better law school than I did, uh, didn't have any coursework or inkling whatsoever in law school about how to actually practice law, uh, particularly the business part of it. Um, I was a solo practitioner for about a year and a half, and that was actually the best experience I had as far as how to run things. It was, uh, you know, pretty basic. I had a ledger book, you know, expenses on one side, income on the other, and I don't do it much differently now. It's just on a different scale. Um, I had, for inspiration, I had, uh, my mother was a business, successful businesswoman, so from her, uh, she got up at, you know, 4 30 in the morning, and uh, this is how long ago it was, still came home and made dinner. So uh, that was an inspiration in terms of work ethic, and she had great business sense. Um, so that's about all I have for you. Can I have my credits now? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're stuck here until okay. 6 o'clock. Right. I'm so sorry. So Chris will give you an overview of kind of what we're going to talk about. We kind of put this in three major areas. But what I, I want to know is if anybody has a particular burning issue or something that they thought was important or wanted to talk about, please let us know. Raise your hand. Um, and if we have any time um, at the end, or we can maybe integrate it, you know, speak up and let us know. Um, yes, ma'am. I have a question. Uh, yes. the, the, how, how do you deal in each, especially the, the firm milieu and, and the, the smaller firm, with the, um, the Gen Xers, the Gen Ys, the Millennials, all, how do you deal with that issue? If you're, not, if you're talking about that, great. If not, throw it in somewhere. <laughs> I mean, I think that maybe follow, follows a little bit into the technology. It, well, it really kind of implicates all of the areas because you've got the relationships, which I think do differ because there are certain expectations that, that partners or shareholders have of associates that some of these younger kids don't really get or don't really understand. Um, and then I think the technology standpoint from that area also is implicated because they know so much about the technology and and it allows for a different style of management um, in terms of presence within the firm offices themselves um, and working outside of the office, yes. From your, each of your individual perspectives, what is the minimum amount of work hours that you expect your lower associates that are non-equity participating in the firm? Okay, so um, the standard 
some of this, I'm going to just kind of touch a little bit on it, and then we'll launch into our um, our presentation because it's going to be touched on a little bit. All right. First of all, let's just talk about the generational workforce in, because it is um, there's a lot of changes, and I'll just take. I've been practicing 29 years, and the the um, I would say that the way that uh, younger lawyers or uh, lawyers of different generations think about the practice of law, think about um, uh, commitment and loyalty and personal time. There's a lot that's very, very different. And we know it, we read those studies about how they're very, everything is, is very different. Um, they're at, they have a world that is at their fingertips and they have technology to take advantage of. And so um, some of the uh, I want to say structure or framework in maybe traditional legal services is um, hasn't necessarily caught up to some of that. So, um, and we'll talk about how that is impacting um, the relationships, the kind of relationships that you have with your um, with your uh, work staff. I'm going to say with the lawyers, the people who are performing your legal services, and then also what kind of technology or modern day uh, systems that you need to have in place you know, to be competitive because if we're going to attract anybody um, who is technology savvy and we aren't as a law firm we are actually going to kind of cut ourselves out of a large pool of potential um, um, attorneys so um, we'll, we will talk about that a little bit um, just in terms of that very specific question um, our, I mean, I don't mind sharing and, and talking about that issue really quickly. Our, we actually set a, um, what we like to call a minimum billable hour requirement. And the reason that we do so is purely for budgeting purposes. In other words, I can't prepare a budget for the fiscal year until I know how much revenue I expect to come into the firm. And the only way in a legal services um, uh, business that you can get revenue, quite honestly, is at least by the billable hour, traditionally. There are other models, and we're going to talk about that lately, alternative fee arrangements um, and whatnot, but I let people know this is a, this is a bargain. Um, you know, we're paying you a certain salary for certain um, uh, qualifications and certain expectations that we have because, quite honestly, I'm running a business. I'm a lawyer by trade. I'm a business in my day-to-day -day job. And if I don't have the, the commitment on the other side for the revenue, that means something else has to give. So that's how we operate um, just generally. Oh, okay. 1850 hours a year. That's, that's the minimum. I don't think you said that. I said 1800. Ours yeah. is 1800. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry if I didn't say that. I was thinking. <laughs> And, uh, and this is billable hours? Billable hours. Okay. So that term. doesn't include like sitting here today or doing your CLA right. type of courses. Yeah. yeah. And what I tell people is if I hire a, let's say um, I, you were a full time employee working 40 hours a week at a, a non professional job, that adds up to so many hours a year, which is hundreds of hours more than the 1800 billable. Um, if you actually thought about it. Um, but we're a profession, and our profession demands and requires that we do many things. Um, many of us are involved in trying to bring in business. Some of us are trying to learn. You're all here today trying to learn and get credit and do the things that you need to do. That's part of your professional development. You have other causes that you participate in. So that's kind of the whole package, if you will, that just would bring you to a full-time employee. And then you have administrative things you all need. So that's the, that's how we think of it. So okay. and then I have oh, sorry. Well, I say uh, Marie being a solo, I don't know yeah, if you have it. So a, my practice is kind of unique because on the criminal defense end it's not billable like hourly. Um, that's more like a you know civil aspect. Did you guys hear her factor? No, sorry. No. Okay, no. Okay. All right. I'm you sorry. have to project, please. So I was just saying that my practice is unique because have the criminal defense and in criminal defense you don't bill hourly or on a contingency um, so I can't really give you know an estimated amount of hours uh, even <laughs> I could just say my own experience even if I think I'm not working full-time 
because I'm a mom, I can assure you I am putting in many hours, you know, throughout the week. So it's I, it's very difficult to say because of the type of law that I do. Um, when it comes to family, a lot of my cases, I also do flat fixed fees for some of them because of the nature of the matter. Some of them are related to criminal aspects where there's domestic violence and a custody hearing. So um, I can't really add too much on a specific uh, hours. Yes. A quick question. Uh, Ms. Livingston said that she needed the billable hours to work with the budget. So I'm curious, because I haven't worked in the fields of personal injury or domestic relations or whatever, or criminal defense, how does a firm like that, or who's doing those kinds of things, figure out a budget for the coming year? I mean, how, how much can you afford to pay for rent uh, or whatever it is that you want to get? What kind of a, how do you do a budget on a, on a, in a world like that? I just don't know. I'm asking. That's a good question. For me personally, I, I set my budget on my actual limitations with time because I've got two small kids and for me, I'm, ju I'm juggling being mom and in that balance and I'm not willing to compromise. Um, it's hard to say, I don't, I don't know if I have the exact answer. Um, from, from my experience doing criminal defense, because that's pretty much, I mean, when I got out of law school and before I got out of law school, I was a clerk in Alameda County in the district attorney's office. So I've always been geared towards criminal offense and tried other areas and always come back to it. Um, whether it's contingency through personal injury or civil with the billable. Um, what I've been told from other attorneys with much more years of experience than myself is you kind of have to design your practice on what your goals are. Um, you know, how much overhead I've, I've seen, especially with criminal defense, um, firms, so to speak, go under because their overhead is so high. Um, and it really, it, it, it comes down to prioritizing. So I will tell you right now, my overhead is very low because I'm one person and there will be times where I wish I had somebody else. Um, but because I'm just starting, I don't want to, you know, jump ahead. And I've seen from startup firms at Astro, who I was associated with, um, and I'm still associated with on a smaller scale, there's that sense where how quickly do you grow? You know, what, when do you take it to the next level? Um, I think my limitations are self-imposed because of family and my own fears. Yeah. So I'm not sure I have 100% an answer for you. Other than prioritize your own goals, your own personal, professional goals. Now, so Harry, when you're at, at your when you're at your firm, is that something that you deal with personally in terms of the budget, or is that something that the other other people at the firm handle? Um, so we have the perhaps overly optimistic view that you know we're going to continue to get work. So the billable hour minimum um, is actually a minimum uh, after which point uh, a lawyer is eligible to get a bonus which is you know, based in part on hours above that, but also you know, there are other performance-related uh, components. So we do budget. Um, some things are fixed. Oh, there are certain components of overhead that are fixed. Rent is a big one. If you have salaried employees, uh, you know, unless there's a change, that's fixed. Uh, healthcare goes nothing but up. Um, so in a sense, that's fixed. But uh, the kind of things we really budget for, um, they're above and beyond those um, basic kinds of overhead things, sort of like marketing, advertising, that kind of stuff. Okay. And then, Renee, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, okay, so we'll move on. Um, I wanted to ask the panelists to talk about um, their business operation in the context of any unique situations that may have occurred over the years that they maybe had to handle certain way from a management perspective so um, is this, I think we're talking about um, some of the evolving relationships with yes. um, our work staff so I, as you know I came from a traditional firm we everybody hired was an employee um, 
and everybody we hired was a full-time employee back when I started at a very traditional firm. And I think that what I've seen and what you see now, at least in the market, is something very different. I think you have all kinds of different business structures that are operating as a legal services business, as a law firm, if you will. And um, we want to talk about that. What are those interesting relationships that you know groups of people come? You know, they come together to practice, and how 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 does that work? Some interesting ideas. And then also, we want to talk about how what are the kinds of relationships that we have with the people that we hire. So, you know, if you look now, you see uh, special counsel of counsel was the very traditional um, way that you could hire someone outside of a normal uh, employee relationship. Independent contractors or contract lawyers. Um, we've seen, we, throughout other things we've seen, we've seen people designated as trial counsel. Um, and so there's a whole host of, of um, categories that we're putting the, the people who are working on legal services with a firm. So that's where I think we're going to talk a little bit about, and I definitely want Marie to talk about this idea of Ad Astra because it was very, it was a very it's an interesting concept, and it's it's different. From our perspective, we have um, we have an actual um, a professional corporation, so we te technically have shareholders, and we have a non-equity um, level of that, and um, we also have employees that are part-time contract and um, not really interested in becoming shareholders. So we kind of have a little amalgam of, um, of everything. The only thing that's really unique about our firm is, is like I was saying earlier, every crystal's our baby at you know 10 years experience. 12 years experience, <laughs> the baby. Everybody else has over 20 years experience, and that's very different, and we actually have used it as a, as a marketing tool because we actually think we service the clients better that way. I don't know that it's the most profitable way as opposed to having a lot of um, associates, but it's, it's what we've decided to do, and um, that's how we operate. But I want you to talk about this interesting sure. idea of so Ad Astra. Yeah. yeah. So Ad Astra was a firm that um, was formed, I think this is the third year that they're going into existence. It started with um, three partners, or it is three partners, Katie Young, who is a colleague of mine, and I was working with her when she was on her own. David Need, who comes from a long history of some big firms in San Francisco, and Wendy Hilger. She's also uh, one that comes from a long history of top firms in San Francisco. So Katie is on the younger end, and she had been working with David. They decided to form this entity, and there was no other attorney under them, as far as actually employed by the firm. Uh, outside of that, they hired myself and three other attorneys on a contract basis. So I'm gonna say contract, but freelance, temporary attorney, they're all used in interchangeably. So you might see a freelance attorney, it's a contract attorney, independent contractor. Um, so basically, we have no stake in the firm, uh, you know, we can't make any decisions. We have our own, each of us had our own contract with the firm, with a certain, uh, an hourly that we were going to be making, and then an hourly that we were going to be billed at. Now I can't, I can't offer you anything on how they structured their budget because I don't know. All I know is um, if there was work, I got an assignment, so I could work as much as I wanted, assuming that there was an influx of work, or as little as I wanted. So for me, with my kids, it was perfect. I could work at home, or I could come in the office. I wasn't required to be there. Um, we would have our meetings, we'd have conference calls. There are many, uh, if you don't know, there are many uh, devices you can use or lines you can use. Uh, freeconferencecall.com is one uh, that, you know, the cost is zero. So uh, 
they made use of a lot of technology, and I won't go into that too much because that's another uh, portion of our discussion. But the point is, I was on my own, so I could still have my practice, which I still always had, doing family and uh, criminal defense, yet I could obtain some other experience doing civil litigation in an area that was fairly new to me. So um, for me, it was the best of both worlds because there was no there was no one breathing down my neck. I need you to make these billable hours. You know? Sorry. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you're going too right. long. Uh, yeah, so it was it was um, it was very relaxed environment. So for me, it was great. I really enjoyed it. It's a great firm. The only reason why I'm not with them right now is because I just had a baby six months ago. So that kind of puts a little bit on um, you know, and I have my existing cases, so I'm trying to focus on that right now, just prioritizing which I mentioned earlier. So that's at Astra and. and and we can talk about it a little bit more after um, Harry goes and gives his uh, point of view of the differences, because what there are advantages and there are also disadvantages, and there are also ethical implications that you should know about should you decide to either be an independent contractor or hire one. Um, so we'll get into that. But we thanks. Um, we use. Uh, People, we have relationships with of counsel at our firm. Uh, probably less so now, um, but in the past we used them more frequently. And really, for us, what it is is it gives flexibility for both sides. It's a formal, regular relationship. Sometimes the idea was that it was a particular uh, attorney who had a specialty area that we didn't really have the full time need for but we wanted to have that safety valve so that it, it was almost comforting um, someone who uh, specialized in writs for example where we didn't necessarily want them as a could use them as a full-time employee but we always wanted them there uh, when we needed them um, so I, I actually think if it's done in the right way following all the rules uh, it's beneficial for both sides um, so, you know, earlier when I was talking about um, a, a workforce who's really technology savvy, and if you weren't um, that kind of a firm or you didn't have that kind of capability, you would lose a certain market segment of people that would be interested. I think the same thing happens to, um, and, and for me, it started initially with women. Um, women who want were professionals, they wanted to continue being professionals, but yet they had children, and for whatever reason, they couldn't. It could be with men as well. It's just my interest originally started around that concept. And all of those women out there who had no um, no home, so to speak, but yet they were very capable, very qualified. They wanted to keep their you know hand in the business because they anticipated someday they'd go back in the market. So that opened up an idea, um, and you, you see it everywhere now. But you know, hiring people on a part-time basis or um, you know, creating um, an opportunity for people to have a place to work. Because again, if you don't allow for that in your firm, you're going to lose a very large segment of, of population, good lawyers, um, to work with you. And so that's that was another thing that kind of, I think, has started this movement for allowing that. But can we move for a second to some of the ethical obligations? Because I don't want us to leave today without thinking about it. Um, when we were preparing for this, it's eye-opening. Um, when Marie told us when we were preparing for this about the way that the firm worked for court, it just made my skin crawl because I was so worried about all of these uh, client confidence issues and um, conflict issues and E&O coverage and competency issues. And so that's what, that's what we're going to kind of just segue in for both sides to think about if you're going to engage in an alternative work situation. You're on. So um, I'll just open up with one um, specific thing, conflict of interest. It actually came up for me in a specific case. Uh, when I started working with Katie and her, just her practice before they were formed at Astra, I came in because they had a civil rights 1983 claim. 
So it was a police brutality case, and I had the criminal background, so I was perfect for the case. It was a federal case. So I said, great, I'm in, I'll take it. Because I don't know too much about that civil stuff, so, um, you know, I'm not, <laughs> that's a little foreign to me, so let me see how, where this goes. So I went in with that case, and then there was another case that came out, and it, it had another criminal aspect to it. And then I realized, oh no, I can't work on that case because there's a potential conflict. It wasn't an actual conflict, but there was a potential conflict. So I had to be screened off of it. So that's um, something that you have to be careful about just because the, the person that you hired on a temporary basis, or if it's you, isn't part of the firm, doesn't mean that they can sit in all the meetings, doesn't mean that you you know have to, that, that you can, actually act like they are independent because even though they are maybe technically independent because you give them a 1099 it doesn't necessarily mean ethically they are if if there's a risk that confidential information is going to uh, going to reach this particular person you have to be setting up your screens for that you have to be constantly thinking about that from the daily conversations among other associates to meetings. We would have regular meetings, so, you know, and, and and it wasn't just me, there was other, you know, potential conflicts with other independent contractors where um, they chose very unique ways of screening. Um, so that's the thing that, that's the first one that pops into my mind, the red flag is the conflict of interest. Um, just confidentiality in general. Um, when you talk about technology, um, when I went to work with Ad Astra and, and transferring from the law office of KDM Young to Ad Astra, we used the cloud system. Things were uploaded to you know a cloud <coughs> provider, and and the actual case file was not really uh, uh, in existence, or they didn't really have case files. And I'm used to case files because in criminal law, we have case files. You bring that case file to court. Family law, we have case files. But I've seen a shift to where people are, are going, you know, with electronic discovery, e-tools, they're just going electronic on everything. So there's a potential risk there too when you're uploading, you know, things to a cloud. Is it really safe? So you have to think about that kind of stuff as well. Um, devices, uh, your phones, can yes. I speak to that for a minute? Should I pose a question? It, and if it's not right, you can save it to the end. Um, on that issue of the cloud, so my partner and I tried to create electronic files in the cloud, and actually the carrier was very helpful. The carrier was able to recommend some kind of locked cloud services that are considered, I guess, about as secure as you can be, barring that a hacker could really get into anything. Right. And when we put those into place, we couldn't get into it because, you know, we're lawyers and we don't know how to do that stuff. But the carrier was happy and, I mean, I guess a hacker could get in. But there was a level we could achieve that seemed to make everybody feel safe. So I don't know whether that's also the panel's experience, but I'd love to hear from you or others in the room because it did make me a little uneasy. Yeah, I mean, I've never, we didn't have any issues as far as anything being intercepted. I haven't come across anybody personally that has had an issue. I know plenty of people have used the cloud. Um, I personally am not a big fan of it, even though I'm a young attorney. <laughs> I just prefer like the hard copy because there's sometimes where you can't find something in the cloud. You've got so many files. I mean, I ran across that. Uh, things all of a sudden get sorted in a different way. Maybe it gets mixed into another case file. That could be an issue. I haven't known somebody to say, you know what, I stopped using Dropbox or whoever they're using because it's not safe. But I anticipate it's fairly new. I'm sure that there will be some litigation somewhere, you know, soon where there are some issues where safety is a concern and, and possibly some opinions uh, coming out. Because it's just too new, I think, right now to really say that it's 100% safe. I personally don't like it. So, I mean, I like like it because it's efficient. It's yeah. super efficient. You know, no Xerox machine, no faxing things back and forth. You know, I mean, that's great. Right. 
and it saves client money, I think, too, and client yeah. time. But anyway, I don't want to divert the group on, yeah. on this topic. We're so. going to talk about um, the um, a little bit about the uh, bring your own device, you know, um, later because I have a lot of issues with that, and that is a, on many levels. Um, so, but we are going to get to that a little bit, and it Great. somewhat touches on that on that okay. cloud yeah. issue as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, on the issue of the bring your own device, I brought my laptop. They didn't give me one. I'm sure if they were established a little bit longer, maybe they would. Um, but the point of hiring me was to save some money. So um, I think that, like Renee said, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that later because there are some concerns with that as well. But I do know plenty of firms who can't afford to, uh, you know, hand everybody a, a cell phone or a laptop and, Nowadays, since all phones, you can get email, you know, so we'll get into that as we get into technology. Um, back to the conflict of interest. Um, I can't stress enough just to be very careful on how much information, well, I think the discussion should be when you're going to hire an independent contractor, you need to be very clear on what the limitations for this person are when it comes to um, not just the assignment, but um, access to information, especially if you're loading things up on a cloud. Um, there are ways to you know, uh, limit a user's ability to get information on the cloud. Um, I know that that in Ad Astro where you could get in, but you could only access certain files the files you were working on. So I can't stress enough that having a clear plan when you have, when you decide to hire an independent contractor on what they can access, what they can be a part of, is critical because if you don't set those limitations, conflicts of interest, at least potential ones, if not actual, can be at the forefront know on a regular basis yeah do you and my question to you is you've got a firm with offices up all over you have a lot of different relationships how do you manage it how do you how do you keep do how do you maintain all your your obligations ethically with all those levels and offices and if you're talking about conflicts we have a program um, where it gets a little bit uh, trickier and where you have to pay even closer attention is we have a few different practice areas and sometimes one of them is workers comp and so they're you know they operate in their own universe and uh, well they you know we kind of have to remind them um, I'm on tape here so <laughs> careful about that we have to remind them that uh, they have to continue to do the checks just like anybody else, although, you know, in some ways it's not so clear that uh, there can be conflicts in a no fault system like that. So we do our best, but it, it's a it's absolutely a challenge. And uh, technology in terms of storing documents, whether it's in the cloud or uh, hard copies or traditional servers, um, you know, it's always balancing efficiency security and expense and you know there are two main areas that I found the most challenging in terms of managing number one by far and away is you know, relationships and people and that's really where I have to rely on my mother and uh, life experience and that kind of thing number two is technology and I think we, we talked this, a little bit about this when we we're getting ready um, for the presentation uh, speaking for myself, anyway, I'm kind of in an odd position because I'm a bridge. So we've got, you know, younger people who are light years ahead of me in terms of their understanding of technology. And then there's a group that's uh, got a little more experience than I do. And, you know, they, we've had, we, we've got some attorneys who still dictate everything and do a tape, everything, time. Their random thoughts, you know, and all gets transcribed. And bridging that, um, 
is a challenge. And I, you know, I don't, I actually skew more towards the uh, older version than I do really understanding all the technology, but I, I try to, to be open to the changes. Um, did anybody have anything else to add on the, um, the relationships with the different Yeah, uh, I was just gonna say, um, you have this hand, handout that's got a lot of rules in it. I'm not going to go through all of them. There are some opinions that I thought were key. We provided that for you. But I hate to say use the word use the word common sense, but for firms that are going to you know try to cut costs down and hire independent attorneys to work for them or with them, you should always disclose it to the client in the sense that, you know, Renee's an independent contractor with our firm, she's working on this matter with us, and uh, we just want to make sure that you're fully aware, she's not a full-time employee, we brought her in specifically for your case, or, or whatever it be, but just be upfront. The rules don't specifically say you should, you absolutely have to disclose. I think it's keep the client reasonably informed about significant developments. So there's some wiggle room, um, but err on the side of caution and, and just be upfront. You should never mislead your client. If you're gonna advertise on a firm that somebody is associated with you, you should put that they are of counsel or uh, trial counsel or however, whatever the relationship specifically is, you should note that so that there aren't any misunderstandings. Um, other than that, I think that's it. I just wanted to that. Yeah, thank you for putting this together. Marie put this together for us, and it's it's a good it's a, it's a good uh, outline of just things to, to keep in mind when you're hiring um, people, the, uh, employees and not. So, yeah, I think everybody's kind of chomping at the bit to get to the technology portion um, of the discussion. So let's move on um, to that, and I'll let Renee start with some thoughts on how technology has impacted and influenced the management of a law firm and some of the benefits and, um, and negative aspects of that. So it's expensive um, to get technology, um, and it's expensive to keep it supported, and it's expensive to have updates. And how, you know, depending on how big your firm is, you've got licenses, and so it's it's a cost item that didn't exist to the same extent that it did before. So that's I mean that's kind of an obvious. We're more sophisticated. We have programs and apps for everything, and that's just in terms of our use. Um, and it, it doesn't actually apply to our marketing or our business development opportunities because there's a whole technology level that we're really not going to touch that much on. So, so number one, it's, it's an expense item. Um, it's something that is necessary, um, as I've mentioned, not only because a lot of young lawyers have been raised on it, so the expectation is, is that it's going to be there, but our clients are changing with the times as well. And depending on who your clients are, that could be at varying degrees, right? We have some very, very sophisticated clients who tell us that we need to use their software for communicating, or um, that they, you know, we have a lot of technology that we spend for billing. Because you know, a lot of companies are using electronic billing. You have to upload your bills now, and they actually ask you to pay for the privilege of doing that. So it's again, it's a cost item, and you have to know and have the different technologies. So it is, from our opinion, it has completely revolutionized the way that we do billing, both on our time entry, how you describe it, um, how you pass muster through audits, and then ultimately how you, you upload it and deal with any issues with the bill. So yeah, it's definitely changed that way. But um, I, I'm gonna um, comment on the one issue that as you can tell is really interesting to me, that we're grappling with as a firm, okay? Because everybody here has a smartphone, right? Everybody has a smartphone. And you probably have an iPad, you probably have a laptop computer, and if you don't have a laptop computer that you take from desk uh, at work to home, you probably have a computer at your home that probably has access to your computer at the office, okay? 
because technology has allowed us to do that. It has allowed us to be lawyers without sitting in front of a um, hard drive. So we're mobile, and we all love that. We love it because we can be walking the dog and checking our email, and we can be on vacation and entering our time, and we can be writing briefs at home and get a document from our server at the office now. So it made our lives really great, but it also has significant risks. And you know, um, there's, there's obviously work-life balance issues that technology has brought with all of us about whether it's a good thing to be accessible 24-7. I don't know that. I thought it was, but I'm not so sure right now, okay? But here's the issue that I'm having, and we're grappling with this at our firm, and so I don't know that I have the answer, and I've gone to probably a dozen seminars on this topic, and I still don't know the answer exactly, is our, our attorneys um, and our, our, all of our staff have phones, smartphones, and we know from recent law that we have to compensate those of our employees who it's necessary for them to have this kind of technology, the, the smartphone and the ability to do work. So we know we have to, we have to come up with a policy to compensate them. That's kind of easy. Um, we just had to deal with it because of technology. But here's the issue is, so if it's not a firm piece of equipment, we don't own it. So we don't own the hard drive itself. But then what about all the information that's on it? If they're conducting firm business on their personal device, that's a concern to me, and that should be a concern to you too. Because if something happens to that device, as it surely will, it'll get stolen, it'll get left in a taxi cab, it's going to, it's going to go missing at some point in time. It has firm business and confidential communications with clients if you allow your employees access to email. Okay? So it, it raises an issue for us in two respects. One, how do I protect client communications and client confidences on a personal device that I don't own? That's one issue. And then the other issue is, how do I not intrude on the privacy interests of my employees. Because they have it's their device, they have personal business and photos and all kinds of stuff on it. So as an employer, I have to worry about the privacy issues when it's their own phone. I wanted to just scrap the whole thing and buy everybody iPhones and say, we own it, it's our number, everything on it is ours, we have unfettered access to it, we will give you your passcodes, and if you lose it, leave the firm or will terminate employment for whatever reason, we wipe it clean. We cut it off. We have 100% control over it. But for a small firm, that's kind of a big expense. Okay? So I don't know if we're, and then everyone has to carry two and everyone grumbles about that. Okay. But so the flip side of it is what can I do to protect it? And so what a lot of things that I've been hearing about is that there are actual programs Obviously, you've got to make your employees passcode lock their phones. That's an absolute requirement if they're going to do firm business on it. Okay? I can't necessarily compel them to give me their passcodes, but I can insist that, and on their good word, hopefully they're doing it, so that no one can open their phone and get their information, number one. But then number two, there are programs that exist out there that you can ask your employee to put on their phone that is the conduit through which they can get firm business. So it's a secondary passcode where they open their phone and there's the Livingston Law Firm app that requires second passcode that we can have some input on what that passcode is. If you're gonna get access to our server, we're gonna require it, okay? And then if there's any problem with the phone or the device or the employee, you can cut that information off through the app that's on their phone. Is it foolproof? No, because you can save documents, you can have a lot of business that's not just necessarily access to the server, but we have to deal with that. And in fact, now our clients are requiring it. They're asking us by questionnaire. What are your security procedures for your employees who use a phone, personal phone, 
for, uh, for uh, client business. Describe it. And your E&O infrastructure is doing it now too. Ours is asking us what those are because it's all cybersecurity risk and you know you've seen lawsuits like that all the time now. So it's a huge issue that you have to actually deal with if you're going to allow your employees to use their own phones. And I don't know what I'd do if, if our employees, our attorneys didn't have their own phones and they weren't texting us and available by email and phone 24-7 sometimes. So it's kind of like one of those um, issues. Okay. You guys talk about it. <laughs> Harry, so you're in a you're in a big yeah. firm with more employees and more attorneys. How does your firm deal with that issue? We bought everybody a phone. You did, yeah. So okay, so you're the, you're the, your people are the ones when I'm at a mediation that are, have like two phones staff. What else? I don't care if they have a, a tin can, but you know, for the second year phone, phone, but they, it's just it one way to address everything we brought up, and it's still not foolproof. In some ways, it's perceived as a benefit too. So yeah. people are happy to get it. You get, you know, people would drop them in the toilet. Do all kinds of things. One one partner did three times. <laughs> right. Three times. So, so now they there's get no the app to defeat that. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Insurance, but then it's even more expensive. Right. It's yeah. just it's um, it's very expensive. Yes. But then, what do you do about the iPads? And their uh, their home computers. Well, do you allow access no. via home computers? So, okay. and this is emerging and uh, has been, you know, a challenge, particularly this year because we switched over and really tried to emphasize uh, tightening up. But um, we don't allow access unless it's through a uh, phone device. So some people have laptops and they can bring home all those kind of things, but it just it presents, at least in our paranoid, maybe paranoid mm -hmm. view, too many um, potentials for security lapses. Well, they say just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out Right, and I, I, I can't, you know, this is one of those areas where <clears throat> I think the, the best advice I can give to everybody is this an area to consult experts. You know, I... I think when we started out, you know, I think our IT person was one of our partner's husbands, which, which is no, which is great up to a certain level. But uh, you know, and then for a while we had the receptionist slash IT person. Who, you know, it's just had a background in video games. You know, but I mean, you know, like, to me, what everything he said sounded good to me. I mean, what do I know? So I, yeah, I think. I think, I don't know, um, you know, I think this is one of those areas, you know, probably like brain surgery that you want to get opinions, shop around, get recommendations, you know, I would go to Renee or go to, you know, and say, hey, who do you, you know, you guys seem like you know what you're doing, who do you use, you know, can you recommend somebody? Yeah, I, and that's true, and there, and that, I think we've, we've gone completely to third party independent person because we did the same thing. Somebody knew somebody who knew someone and we got a great deal, we thought. <laughs> and so now it's a completely independent IT person and we use somebody as a consultant because we don't have some, a, a large enough need um, to have someone on staff. But again, it's another it's another expense. Another thing to budget for. Yeah, another thing to budget for, another reason we need your hours, right? <laughs> so, and then I, the only other thing I want to talk about um, um, technology is, a, is an issue that came up when we were talking about and, and um, I'd be interested on both your perspectives because um, the issue comes up since we have the technology to allow the people that work on our files not to be in the office to have all that flexibility that we said that we wanted to have because they wanted to work part-time or they wanted to do something else um, is that okay is that okay for people not to be in the office? Do we use that technology that we have um, and not have them, uh, uh, people in the office? And so we always struggle with that because um, in, with so much of what we do is collaboration in legal work and the communication of ideas and um, if we just find that FaceTime, just like we do with clients, is really an important thing. But I'd be interested on how, what your perspectives are as well. 
Um, honestly, I, if it wasn't because of my family situation, I would much rather be in an office with people working <coughs> together because of what Renee just mentioned. Collaboration is so important. And I mean, unless it's just you, I mean, right now it's just me, but unless it's just you, FaceTime is, is key. Whether it's, ah, I've got this, you know, nagging issue that I can't just, I just can't shake this thought from a deposition or whatever it is, or <coughs> I can't find something that I'm looking for on Westlaw or Lexis. It's very lonely if you're by yourself. So if you don't have to do it because you're not breastfeeding a child or something, then FaceTime is, is much more preferable. If you really want to collaborate and be productive and, and, and gain that valuable um, experience with other attorneys. And I think um, the work product, I think there are certain tasks where you can be on your own and it may not be so much of an issue. But I will say that even though I was working remotely, there were many times where I would go into San Francisco because I had to. Um, and, and meeting with clients, I mean, clients don't just always want to have conference calls. Sometimes, depending on the matter, they want FaceTime. So you, you have to be cognizant of that as well. Don't let the technology push you too far out. I, those are all great points that I told. I mean, they're true for, you know, whether you're 30 lawyers or one lawyer. Um, it's just a, I guess, internally, especially with um, different offices, you know, you have, I think it's really important, really just for a spree de corps, I mean, the exchange of ideas and round tabling things, some of that you can do on the phone. Uh, we have email groups, you know, you, it started out, and you always, like, for me, you know, I can't sit here and tell you that I've done a good job at predicting some of these challenges, but, you know, some of them you identify. At a certain point, not everybody in the firm who's practicing a different kind of law wants to hear about, you know, what somebody thinks else thinks is fascinating. So then you start creating email groups, so only people in this practice. You also want to be careful about not uh, fractionalizing, you know, creating rivalries, and, you know, sharks versus jets. And, and no, you get you get a little of that. It's kind of funny, or you know, like people in LA don't like these people. So all that stuff's a challenge, and that's the the human aspect of it. I think um, I, I think face to face interactions are very very important. You know, everyone here knows the challenges of emails and how things can be misinterpreted or misconstrued. Sometimes it's better. Me personally, I hate talking on the phone, so I'd almost rather drive somewhere. I'd rather email or have a face-to-face -face meeting. I can't stand talking on the phone. We have other people in the office that you know, can't get along. Can, I mean, it's positive because they get a lot done. I just, for whatever reason. What about, here's one other issue just to throw out there that technology has affected the management of a, of a practice and it really has to do with staffing. And you are okay. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, originally it was, uh, two, we used to have two lawyers assigned to one legal assistant and then as lawyers got more savvy on their laptops, then we put three lawyers on a legal assistant and I, I know firms that have four and even five lawyers assigned to a single assistant in large part because of the attorney's ability to use technology and laptops and um, uh, dictation and, and whatnot. And the thing I want to talk about is this, the dictation right now because with Dragon Dictation, we just did an experiment, Crystal and I, with the, the program that's just in part of Microsoft Word. Word. Yeah, yeah, with Microsoft Word because somebody has Dragon in our office that's using it effectively and we wanted to try something else and see and I am a rabid dictator on my iPhone. I dictate in the car, text, emails, everything. So it's, it's 
it's a skill that I'm glad I had, but I think it's coming back because I think the new generation's learning how to do it. My kids are. Um, but it's, it's affecting um, the balance in the office in terms of our staffing. Is it good on the one hand? Well, yeah, because if you don't have um, full-time staff that used to be there, it's, I guess potentially it's a, it's a, a savings. But on the other hand, you know, I think we're missing a lot of opportunity to have partners in our office who help with our business in a supportive way that if they're not there, um, it, I just, I don't know, I think you'd have to be careful with that balance. But are you, how are you guys doing that now? Oh, I was just gonna say, uh, I've noticed in, in, from when I first came out of law school, the, just the expansion of technology, um, it seems like the staff is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because people are more efficient, more technologically savvy, or there's a program that does what this person physically used to do. And so you don't really have to pay that person. You can just pay the subscription for the program and you're virtual. Um, I've known other firms that have eliminated who answers the phone and they you know pay a service to do that or they have a Google voice or whatever whatever it is but um, I'm not so sure it's a good thing um, it does it has its benefits as you said it saves but sometimes I prefer you know to, to actually speak to somebody who's in the office and not somebody who's in Kansas or somewhere else because they're saving money receptionist or this, the phone service outside of the office because they don't they don't know it's like it, when Renee was in trial for several weeks um, very recently I'm still recovering um, and you know but it was great to have a you know a receptionist in the office that, that knows okay well Renee's in trial four days a week for the next several weeks would you like me to send her an email you could uh, you know she'll be here on Friday I mean you know, somebody that really knew the practice and knew what was going on in the office versus some phone service is not going to have that that information they're simply going to say oh they're not picking up or they're not available let me point you to voicemail so yeah, it's, all, it's all for a culture what you what you want your culture to be and, and it, it all you define it you pay for it or you know one way or another so it's just but it is technology um, again and then what do you do Harry with because um, I know you have um, a wide range in the attorneys that you have. You've got all this great technology that your firm has, and then some don't want to use it. Yeah, it's, it's uh, first of all, it's just a sense in the room. Who here's a solo? Do you mean, who, okay, so, mo so uh, and who, anybody here in a firm over 20 lawyers? So we're all we're all pretty much in the same boat. Um, I came from the perspective my first legal work out of law school was as a solo, kind of in association with two more experienced attorneys. So I learned how to do everything. I could do you know do my own letters, go down to court, file things, be nice to the clerks, right. <laughs> so that even if I screwed something up. It would get filed anyway, you know all the, all those things, and uh, it's a double-edged sword in a way because that's my expectation level for Generation X or whatever you want to call them. I, I want them to be able to do everything. Um, so here's what, just generalizing, uh, newer attorneys are great at technology. Um, one of the things that's fascinating to me that is unexpected is they all can type really well. I mean, they're, they're going away and I'm, you know, I'm like, wow. You know, I'm a decent typer. These people are, you know, it's because they've been, they've been doing it since they were kids, type, you know, typing on keyboards and all that stuff. Um, we've got another, you know, generation and a half of like I said, uh, tape dictators, 
uh, absolutely have to have a transcriptionist, you know, somebody that understands all that stuff. We've experimented with Dragon. Some people can do it, some people just won't, and it's hard, it, it's a really hard thing uh, to have that kind of conversation. Um, I think we touched on this a little bit, but one of those areas that it often comes to a head is timekeeping. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we the majority of our work is billable, so obviously getting the time capture and everything, or people who like to write it down on paper, dictate it, have their assistant do it, and that's slipping away. And, it, you know, in some ways it's a loss, but um, financially it's probably a positive to make the investment. Up front of the technology, but you know all those. To me, all those things are trade off. I think you know, like you're talking about with the receptionist. I, you know, for for the practice we have, it's critical to have you know uh, walking, talking, breathing human beings to answer questions. And by the way, who your receptionist let clients know that she was off on Fridays when she had trial? No. That would be, no, no that would no. be verboten. She was in the office on No, Friday. that's even verboten. The message would be She's unavailable <laughs> from this day to next day because I, when I'm in trial, that's, that's the greatest. I don't, I don't think they actually, well, I'm, they better I, not have. I don't think I'm she actually come said down she was there. available Friday. I think it was more of a, she'll, she'll get back to you I'm coming down on there. Friday. That's oh, the one man yeah. thing yeah. I have to add. Like, my auto reply technology on my email so says I'm alone. unavailable for yes. four weeks. There you go. That's more like <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you guys have any other questions on technology? Yeah. Oh, no, oh, because we're, we're probably going to move yeah, on to a different on. subject, but unless somebody has a question on technology. Yeah. Well, okay, if you're using a billable hour model, you're using technology, um, there's a wide range of things. That you've got complex systems like uh, time slips, and then it varies down to some people are using QuickBooks or Excel spreadsheets and things like that. That's one factor. Another factor is the question is, really where my question is, is does anybody find that it's helpful to uh, track time for non-billable activities? We seem to be very interested in a lot of non-billable activities and you turn around at the end of six months and say, well, where did all that time go? We were here, we had to bring in food for people to stay. We don't see the uh, collectible billable hours uh, stacking up the way that we need them to. So we do track non-billable time. And we actually, in our billing program, have probably five different categories of non-billable time. And we ask people to, to put down not just, you know, what, you know, two hours in a day. We actually ask for descriptions. and. Uh, I do it myself just so I know what I do because when I go back before I post my time, I'm looking at my month at a view and I can see how many hours total show up and on the days when it says 2.5, I know I've got a problem. I know what happened on that day because I either, maybe I was taking the day off and going to the, you know, a personal thing or maybe I was at a deposition in LA and I just forgot to input it or I was speaking at the, Contra Costa County Bar Association thing. So I do it for myself as kind of a um, double checking that I haven't missed something in a major way. Um, I also do it um, as an example um, so that I can explain to the shareholders in my firm what I'm doing. And I spend a lot of time on management, but my, my highest best use, quite honestly, is in my marketing. And I um, track my marketing activities because that is my contribution in large part to the firm. And um, it may explain why billable hours are one way one month versus another month, but it, it's kind of the whole picture. Um, the whole picture, Renee, um, from my professional development and my professional activities. And so we ask our attorneys to do it. And their performance is evaluated on it to a certain extent as well. 
um, because we do ask our attorneys to be involved in marketing activities and business development activities. And um, so that is an expectation. Again, coming back to if you're just working full time, you still have to account for about three or 300 hours just to get to full time over your billable hours. And um, I'm very interested in knowing what you're doing for those 300 hours, because I hope it's for the benefit of the firm in one way or another. And if you're, if you're devoting your time for professional development or business development, you're promoting the firm. Okay, Harry, you've got like one and a half minutes or less. <laughs> okay. And then we're moving on. No, I, I think it's a, first of all, time slips, to QuickBooks, QuickBooks and time slips interface, and I believe that you can use Excel spreadsheets that uh, you can upload to time slips. So we, the one thing that we found kind of constant is time slips is a great program, and we use it. I don't know, you might have a different. Opinion. We have a different program, okay. and I don't okay. know that I'd buy it again. Yeah, it's so. that's one of those things. Yeah, um, I think keeping track of your non-billage time is fantastic for a whole bunch of reasons. It really uh, forces you to think about what you're doing. I don't do a very good job of doing that. And I I like to needle. I manage by needling sometimes only my partners because it's not really a good way to mentor other people. But I have one partner who's always got tons and tons of non-billage time. I'm like, wow, that's great. Yeah. Way to go. Like, where's the bubble? <laughs> so, not, probably not out of the, maybe out of Donald Trump management <laughs> handbook, but not out of anybody else's. So, that's my answer. Um, all right, well, then let's move on to kind of our final aspect. And unfortunately, we're running a little short on time, but the final part of the program was to talk about uh, the, you know, potentially different financial relationships between the law firm and its clients, as well as the law firm and the people working for them, and, and how that works in a non-traditional uh, management. Someone else go. Okay. We'll start the so, discussion. Um, I down because I wouldn't forget. So, in my experience, I have seen a variety of different uh, financial relationships not just me personally, but just other firms I've known or people I've known who've worked in other firms. I'm in the North Bay, and in the North Bay there is one firm, the community is very small, I'm specifically in Marin County, it's a very small, tight-knit legal community. One of the biggest firms uh, in San Rafael, everybody is a partner in this firm. So, how does a firm make money? They, really, the firm itself does not make money. What you produce as a partner is yours. You pay an overhead fee. Everybody has their overhead fee. Once you paid it, what you bring in is yours. If you want to bring support staff to work you know, with you on a trial you're working on, that's up to you. If you want to bring your kids, that's up to you. But the firm itself does not make money. And this firm is very successful and very big. They cover many different areas of law. So, I mean, they're pretty much full service. Um, and I've seen other firms make it seem that they're full service by bringing in either an independent contractor, uh, entitling it as an associate attorney or of counsel to kind of cover, you know, different areas other than civil litigation estate planning or um, personal injury or whatever it may be and, and they and the firms that I'm thinking of they do disclose the relationship on their website so that it doesn't appear that this person works specifically for the firm um, and, and those are just ways to, to make it seem like you cover more than you really do um, and, and keeping your costs down as well um, there you go. oh uh, well, I think, Harry, I'm actually interested from your perspective, because you are a larger firm, do you, you know, I, I think that the relationship with the employees or the shareholders isn't as much of interest, I think, as 
maybe the financial arrangements you might have with, with different clients in terms of alternative fee arrangements or fixed fee agreements and things like that. Okay. Um, I think, to me, we've been talking about more or less the business of law, and there, you know, we could someday somebody will put a course together in actual law school where it belongs. But whether you're talking about a fee relationship, or you're talking about compensation internally, or any of those iterations, you have to have a really a bedrock principle and philosophy. And so that's what I always fall back on is we're all in the, biz the business of law, but we're really here to help people. So I, that's our default. That's what, you know, we have a, um, a practice that's, you know, very personal, you know, individual based. So it's always about helping people and their families. And that's always got to be the default in it. Now, what I tell people when I get accused, when I needle my partners and do things like that, um, what I tell people internally is that you know we're we're absolutely here to serve others and to help, but also we're here for us and our families. Like if we're if we're giving, because I listen, I've got the best lawyer in our firm by far and away is a straight up true believer. So this particular person would work for free for, for a cause that he believed in, which is great and what makes him you know, a tremendous advocate, but he's also got you know, a family. And so you have to try to balance those two things. Since you're in the business of helping people, that's gotta be first, but you also have to do it you know, in a, I think in a business savvy and ethical way. So as far as the different types of fee structures, um, we have a balance uh, that we've developed between, we do more and more um, contingency fee work, but it's in essence financed by billable hours, traditional fee work, which really what we do is it's insurance defense. And it's a challenge. And what it's a challenge on the business perspective is cash flow. Um, so that's, we have to pay very close attention to making sure the bills go out, making sure they get paid, making sure expenses are low. I'm not, uh, in our particular field, uh, there's actually a lot of competition that can get kind of ugly and silly, maybe borderline and unethical in my opinion. One of the things, um, that's out there is for we represent unions. So for unions uh, to do retainers, all encompassing retainers, the problem with that, if you think about it, if you're charging an entity a set amount of money, there is a motivation to do less work. You know, so somebody's getting a bargaining bargain in that uh, relationship. So it's either the client. Um, by getting you to do you know more work than the value, the, strip, the dollar value of um, the check they're sending you every month, or it's the lawyer, and I don't like that. I'd rather try to charge, figure out what a reasonable hourly fee is, and um, have people pay it. And uh, we do some for criminal, for a very finite criminal defense stuff. We do some flat fee stuff some other kind of services, and then it's just trying to figure out how many hours that's going to take. Yeah. So that's my answer. So over the years, um, I've worked for a traditional um, billable hour uh, type of situation. But I want to say about a decade ago, maybe even a little bit more than that, um, there was a very big movement especially in those kinds of legal services that are more commodity kind of services or, you know, more, I don't want to say cookie cutter, but similar kind of litigation. There was a large movement to move to either flat fee arrangements um, for certain kinds of litigation or alternatively, um, other alternative arrangements such as blended rates, 
know, to account for the highs and the lows, and or um, a flat fee arrangements um, phased through litigation, and then some that were um, actually um, with with incentives, if you will. If you um, settle a case at a certain phase. Uh, there'll be a, a, a kick, a bonus to the law firm because that promoted early resolution. And if it if it's here and you get a result that's this whatever, then maybe there would be a kickback to the client or whatever. So we saw a lot of this, and despite it being just um, very prevalent on the market, we actually didn't undertake an awful lot of it. When push came to shove. Um, there were certain flat fee arrangements we declined. We just didn't feel we could make a, a profit at it. And it wasn't going to be, like Perry says, if it's not going to be profitable, you're going to begrudge it, and it, it won't get the attention and compromise your what you were doing. We just didn't go there. Um, and what I've seen now is, um, it's really funny, a, a less emphasis on some of those alternative fee arrangements again, where people are just back looking at um, hourly rate and what is a fair or a, a reasonable value for the services that are provided. And over and over again, um, I have heard clients say, we don't mind paying your rate, we just want to make sure that we're getting the value that is associated with that rate. So you don't need to lowball me, we'll pay what you think, but we want uh, the value for that. We want the good service, we want the, the results, we want everything else that goes with it. Um, and we want budgets and I but that's the, probably the biggest single thing we get requests for is budgets. So how do you how do you do that if everyone in your firm has got ten or twelve years experience and you don't have the support staff that with the step billing? So you know you could do something at three hundred dollars an hour, or if you're illegal to do it at one hundred fifty dollars an right. hour. How does that work for clients in, in the billing arrangements? And those so we do have paralegals. Okay. We have really good paralegals. Yes. So we do a lot of uh, work, quite honestly, that junior associates used to do, our paralegals do. Okay. And that's the clients actually mandate that. They gave us a list of uh, items that says, this is not considered attorney work. If, if there are certain things, we'll push back and say, oh, no, this actually is. We'll let them start it, but this actually does include require at least some attorney work and if we explain it and tell them they they always go with it um, we have an problem but we do use paralegals as, a, as an associate attorney I mean in my perspective I'd rather have a good paralegal than a yeah. new attorney and I hate to say it but this goes back to that Gen X and, and generational issues Statistically speaking, and I will I will tell you that I've got to many programs on this as well, and I'll give you my own experience. We are very lucky to have retain an, a, a new lawyer out of law school for more than two years. It's just, and I don't, I used to be upset about it, angry. I'm not anymore. I understand it. I understand that there's a mentality and a change and the, the perspective is no longer firm loyalty. You're gonna take care of me, I'm gonna take care of you. It's just we're in a change, we're in a different world. So I don't fight that anymore. But but you know what happened? It affects my willingness to invest in you, which is a sad thing. And I'm still trying to I'm working on how do we how do we change that? Because if I'm going to invest training and send you to seminars and I'm going to uh, expose you to work and give you my time for free to train you and give you exposure to my clients and teach you how to become a marketer and you're gone in two years I, I didn't invest very well and so that's how the generations have affected me it's caused me not to want to hire young lawyers I'd rather hire a paralegal who's going to be much more long-term and, and quite honestly firm loyal and ultimately with training will be as valuable um, as, as a young associate. So I'm sorry that I had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. okay yeah. Well, we are at our time, but does anybody have any questions uh, about anything we covered? Now, well, it has to do with management of firms, and it has to do with social media, and the effect social media has impacted on each of your firms 
And number one, do you have a policy on that? How was the policy developed? And could you share that with anybody that might ask that? And each of you, and, and you might be in a little different stage, but I need your understanding of what, what you think the effect of social media impacts on a law firm side is. And also you, the big, big guy. Uh, so doing stupid things on social media has given us a lot of business. Um, so full disclosure, uh, what we do, we represent police officers. And so the number of uh, ill-advised things is sometimes astonishing, even though I was a police officer and so I can empathize in a certain way. So you would think that all of those mistakes would be cautionary tales to the attorneys in the firm, but not always. So, um, you know, our, our policy is a common sense one. It's basically don't be incredibly stupid. Um, it's a one-page policy. One sentence. Yeah. But we, have, we do have policies, and it says that in much better language, but that's basically what it is. We don't, um, we don't have a Facebook page, for example, for our firm. We don't tweet. Um, what else don't we do? We don't do a lot of things. Um, yeah, you know, despite, I guess, technology being my generation, I'm not that technologically involved. I mean, I have a Facebook, my own personal Facebook, but I don't have a Facebook page. I'm just now starting to get into Yelp because someone suggested that. Um, but I, because I do criminal defense, I'm very cautious on how much information I put out there. And I have small kids, so um, you can never, you know, be too cautious, I believe. So I'm, I don't utilize those tools so much. I utilize more um, techno technological tools like LinkedIn because then it allows me to um, network with other professionals, um, not only attorneys, but when I do my family practice, sometimes I need to potentially get a therapist involved or um, a visitation center. Um, in my criminal defense, perhaps I need a good investigator, so I'll ping on some of my um, other colleagues that I know have established networks with certain types of industries. So I put more value in that. Um, and then I also put more value in the FaceTime um, and, and actually networking in person with people and joining groups um, to market yourself, like Renee says. I think that's invaluable. There are a lot of different groups that you could uh, join, just to name a few. Um, provisors, uh, and, and these are groups that are um, open to different professions, um, not just attorneys. And I think that's important, is kind of stepping outside the box. Um, someone suggested to me, uh, another young Colonel Defense attorney, he said, join things that you like to do. Don't just, you know, go to the bar events or whatever. But do you come to those? Yeah. Yes, yes. Do you come to all the bar events? All the bar events. But and and especially the bar events that will uh, network with other professions as all as well, like real estate uh, and development. But he suggested, you know, try to also focus on the things that you enjoy doing, because then it doesn't seem like, oh, I have to go to this, you know, networking meeting with, you know, dentists or whoever it is. That is against dentists but um, so and I hadn't thought about it that way because you never know when you're going to meet some a potential new client or a, just a relationship that will bring you a potential new client um, so I can't emphasize that enough I know the question was more on social media um, I don't tweet um, I never really I never really thought it was cool to be honest um, I just I don't like it um, I don't know, I'm just, social media to me is, is, I know it's the wave, it's where we're going, but I kind of pull back because sometimes too much information is not that great for people, so. So I probably have the, 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 the uh, yeah. I think social media drives your business. I believe that. Now, not having, uh, having said that, and I am a true believer, 
we, as a firm, have not done the best at. Um, but I believe that anybody I touch, and by that I mean through social media or personal contact or any way, is a potential referral source. I believe that. Um, and um, if you, it, it's like casting, it's like I tell people, the wider you cast your net, the more likely you drive business to your firm. And um, that's, social media only allows you to cast your net exponentially further, in, in my opinion. And whether it's a personal Facebook page where I have told people that I've been in trial, I want them to know I'm a trial lawyer. I want you to know that. I want you, when you have a trial, need to remember me. That's what I, why I say it. Or whether it is your website presence, or your newsletter, or whatever. It, it, I, I believe it drives business. And, and, and you believe that because people have come to you and said? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, our, 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 the largest share of our business is, is actually, we believe, website driven. Uh, they know us by reputation or by referral, but it, they'll come to the website. And um, that is where you need to put your best foot forward. And if they type your name in, you want them to pull articles, speaking engagements, anything that you have been interested in. And you have to kind of work to make that happen a little bit. So that's my perspective. But, but that being said, we could do a much better job at it. Yes, how overdue are we on that website? Yeah, update? I know. It's going to be good. <laughs> it's going to be great once yeah. it's done. Yeah. So anyway, we'll end our program today. If you have, we'll be here for a few minutes. Um, if you have any uh, additional questions, and we're always available by email if you want to follow up on anything. But thank you for coming and being such a good audience. Thank you.